Hi, Blake Lee Page. So nice to have you with us. This is Audra, Max's mom from Max Love Project, and we're here to do another one of our health coaching sessions using Google Plus Hangouts on air. And thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely. I'm going <laughs> to start with a question from Suzanne, one of the moms in our group on Facebook. And she asks, what might be, or I'm sorry, we might be starting our son on the DFMO clinical trial where you have to stay away from foods high in polyamines. Do you have any advice on this? Now, Suzanne is a mom in the Max Love Project Fierce Foodies Facebook group, and her child is um, fighting neuroblastoma. So this is from that perspective. And I'll hand it over to you, Blakely. Okay. So I don't know a ton about, um, well, I don't know anything about the actual clinical trial, um, but I know a little bit about the drug that they use and the polyamine foods. Um, and by little, I mean just barely scratching the surface. So um, what I understand about the polyamine foods is that they are, um, is that the, they want you to avoid them with the medication because the whole process is trying to inhibit tumor growth by limiting these, the body's production or the, the body's use of these polyamines. Um, the problem is some of the foods that are high in polyamines are also some of our really tried and true, well-tested anti-cancer foods. So when you look at the anti-cancer diet um, of, you know, using turmeric or using fermented foods and those types of things, then those actually produce can produce polyamines. And so you run into a little bit of a catch-22 of being, it can be really hard to navigate, well, are these things actually causing polyamines and, you know, promoting polyamines and causing cancer even though, or promoting cancer even though these are our anti-cancer foods. And so it gets really confusing. And from the little bit that I've been able to glean from kind of the network, everyone seems still a little bit confused on it. Um, so my suggestion to you would be to go back to your doctor and see if he knows anything about the actual process in the body. Is If the poly, poly means that are derived from food, are they the same process in the body? Do they do the same thing in the body as the ones that the body produces itself? Are the biochemical mechanisms the same? Because um, that would give us a better insight in how important it is to really limit these in our food sources. Is this a general idea that says, you know, a polyamine here does the same thing as a polyamine over here, and so doctors are saying limit these in your diet. From what we know of biochemistry and how the body works, that doesn't always happen. So, you know, one thing that your body produces versus another substance, the same substance that your body gets from food, can actually do different things biochemically in your body. So I would be interested to know biochemically what's the process there and why are we inhibiting the foods is it just a general a general idea? Is there something specific that's actually happening when those foods are eaten? Another suggestion would be that, you know, in the scope of that, you know, the list of foods that you'll probably be given, um, my take on that is on, on those types of things with food and drug interactions is usually to keep the amount pretty stable to not have, like, crazy high days and crazy low days and then to limit the high polyamine foods. So, you know, if you do get to a point where you really are going to look at that list and start to address it with food, I would limit the high ones and not get too crazy over the medium and the low ones because you're going to make yourself crazy trying to do that um, because it's, you can't keep track of all of them because they're in so many different things. So I would focus on the highest ones and then go back to your doctor and say, biochemically, do we know the effect of food polyamines on the body um, do we know that that really has a significant, significant enough effect that I should stop using foods that are otherwise anti-cancer foods? So that's, that's what I would say with that one. Awesome. Thank you so much, Blakely. And I think we'll do one more of a, a parent question in with this segment, Great. and then we'll move on to our other um, segments from here. So this is from Kathy. She's a number, another member of our group, and her question is this. We know tons of healthy foods. But the challenge is how to make our kids eat them. My child is 10, and he wants to eat like a normal normal kid. So my question is how to educate our kids to eat more healthy while our media doesn't support this. Again, this is a family um, facing childhood cancer in their family looking to eat healthier and encourage their kids to take on a, a, more of an anti-cancer diet. Right. 
This is so tricky because I don't know your child. And I think personality and history with food of that child really plays into kind of what approach would be taken. Um, you know, introverted child versus an extroverted child, it, you know, actually can make a big difference in how they accept new things, in my opinion. And so, um, in general, I would say just start gradually, even though you would love to be able to overhaul his whole diet so that you're getting the most um, bang for your buck, the most effect that you can in his nutrition as he fights this. Um, my hunch would go kind of like I do when I transition families onto a paleo diet is start with one meal at a time. And so if you start with breakfast, then you start to slowly change the types of breakfast foods that you offer and have a conversation about, you know, the good things that are in those foods and how they help the body, but don't pound it and push it to the point that he's refusing and rejecting and not wanting to be part of healthy eating because it's always a negative experience for him. So if that means that, you know, one day a week he doesn't get to choose, you know, he doesn't have cereal anymore or something like that. I mean, start slow and slowly start to find new breakfast items that he actually likes and give him some time to like to like them, give him some time to admit that he likes them. <laughs> because if there's already been any pushback, then he might dig his heels in and, and try not to like it <laughs> just because it's the thing that mom wants to do. So, again, that's all dependent on a kid's personality and what's happening in the family culture. And so it's it's hard to totally answer that without knowing the family, but I would say start slow start with one or two foods at a time, start with one meal at a time. You know, maybe his lunch that he takes this to school is the very last thing to go, where breakfast and dinner at home can be really um, changed more quickly because he doesn't have the pressure, the social pressure of school. Um, and you keep as, as things as normal as possible for his school lunch until he gets on board, starts feeling better, starts to be able to engage in some of the things that are happening. Um, the language around it, again, is tricky. You don't want to push too hard. And everything be about food and everything be about, you know, food is going to help our cancer because it can actually create some fear in kids that, well, what if I eat something that's not healthy? Does that make my cancer grow? Um, and we don't want to do that to kids. It's not, it's not, it's not appropriate. <laughs> you know, they've still got to live free and happy lives. And so you've got to tread lightly when they're that age. You know, if your child were, you know, the two to five range, it'd be totally different. But with a 10 year old, you got to tread, go slowly, and let them give them a chance to have some buy-in by eating foods that they actually like, even though they're healthy. What are some of the things that that could be done for that buy-in? For example, um, would a ten-year-old maybe? I don't have a ten-year-old. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and so for them, the stories about superfoods are really compelling. So, yeah. you know. For them, we're talking about green superpowers, and you know, this is what the the wonderful things that these foods do, and how powerful they are, and um, you know, the Avengers take on it, and all of that. But for a ten-year-old, you know, you've got they're kind of beyond that sort of narrative, maybe, and it may still resonate a little bit. But you know, what about speaking about athletes like the LA Lakers? Just all of them are on a paleo diet now, right? And right. Um, what about speaking about science? You know, kids, when we've done our cooking classes, we found cellular health is really fascinating to kids. And at that point, it's not just your mom saying, because it's healthy and because I say so. You know, it's sort of like, right. well, you're empowered to make a decision. I really want to help you make those decisions. So let's lay this out and let's read the labels. Let's see how you really feel about, we can look these up, we can look up what these ingredients are, and let's see how you feel about how that may feel in your body. Or if you want to take a mindfulness approach and maybe like, a, you know, try it out. How does this feel to, you know, for this to be your sustenance? Are there things like that that might work for a 10-year-old? I think I think some of the mindfulness, some of the science, um, and engaging them and even some of the gardening with fruits and vegetables, getting them to grow some things of their own, all of those more tactile, integrative things are going to be helpful because I think you're right that you're right on the cusp of those narratives um, of superhero superpowers not working the same probably for a 10-year-old that they would even for a 7- or 8-year-old. Um, but, you know, that... It, again, it depends on the kid. You know, if your kid's into science, then it would be awesome to learn about what foods do in our body and actually kind of dig into a version of the biochemistry of it. Um, so I think those are great ideas to explore. I think that's exactly the right way to approach it is what, what motivates and empowers my child. And if you can kind of think about it that way, then how do I incorporate 
what I know about what motivates and empowers my child, how do I then translate that into healthy food for them? Um, and then some of the mindfulness of when they, you know, of how they feel can be really helpful. If they don't have enough good food in their body for long enough, they may not notice a difference. But I know plenty of kids, you know, that off gluten, you know, when they've gotten off gluten, for example, then they have, they really want something that has gluten in it and the parent lets them have it. And then they make sure to kind of go back and check in on how you're feeling. And if the child's willing to be honest, they usually are able to say, I'm tired or my tummy hurts or sometimes if they've had, um, you know, a whole lot of sugar and they're cranky um, or their blood sugar drops and it's mood altering, then a parent can say, um, I wonder if the sugar, you know, I wonder if all that sugar may have, may have um, caused you to, you know, not be able to be as nice to your sister or something like that. Um, and that, that works at a lot of different ages to kind of step back and say, I wonder if that had an effect on that and kind of ask the question back to the child where they can say yes or no. Even if they say, no, I don't think it did. They're still thinking about it and they're still stopping and assessing their body and thinking about what their body might be telling them. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Blakely. We're going to uh, move on to another segment. So Kathy and Suzanne, I hope this was helpful and of course will um, be available for more questions and then we can do follow-up questions in the group. But we're going to move on to another segment. I think we're going to talk about macronutrients next in our, in our next segment. So thank you so much, Blakely. I'm going to stop the broadcast and thanks for tuning in.